gentlemen, here's Frankie Howard. Frankie Howard's career had the ups and downs of a roller coaster, but for 45 years he was one of Britain's oh. funniest comedians. Well, don't take a vote on it. <laughs> the prologue. Frank was probably very unaware of political correctness, certainly as far as women were concerned. Silly old bag. <laughs> he insulted me, but he warmed to me. Oh. He said, are you this commonest muck person that I'm supposed to be working with for this season? Oh, there's a lying cow. <laughs> the studio would get a brand new suit. He put it on and he looked scruffy because that was Frank. Trust him to stick his oar in, big head. He was the only man I ever knew who could get a cold audience eating out of his hand inside two minutes. You will pardon you. When I was a guest man, I used to work for them. And I... <laughs> He's common as muck, that one there. <laughs> Join her over here. <laughs> no, no. I was, no, I was saying I used to be a guest. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> loosen something, loosen something. Poor soul. <laughs> Poor nothing worse, your knickers out of focus. <laughs> Francis Alec Howard was born on the 6th of March, 1917, and spent his childhood in Eltham, south-east London. He became a filing clerk, but his first love was amateur acting. Frank's had a way of delivery, and his way of delivery had started naturally by being a very nervous person. So when he went for an audition to Brada, which he wanted to be, he wanted to be an actor. And of course, you were saying that, you know, uh, to be or not to be, that is the question. No, no, listen. No, of course, he never got past the audition. Frankie turned to comedy in the army and in 1946 became a professional comedian. Within a year, Frankie Howard was a household name on BBC Radio's Variety Bandbox. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Be a singer, how to be a singer by Francis Howard. Frank was so big, he had 42% of the country. Now, you think of that now. You think of one show or any show on television or radio that's getting 42%, that's nearly half the population. When you saw him, it made you love him even more he was, because he was funnier in, in the flesh with that face, with the voice. It all, it all married up. No, but he said, ah, no, ah. Now I'm glad you asked, no, because no. <laughs> Fair dues. The O's and the R's, uh, Frank, they, they, I think they, they, they used to vary. No, ear. Yeah. what's the day? Now, Ray and I started sort of putting in one or two. In fact, I said, I'd write it, I'll put in the O's and R's. And other people we've spoken to, they said, well, the first thing he said, where's the U's and R's? The hesitations came in, uh, according to him, because he was wondering what he was going to say next. I've got some terrible, awful news to tell you. Oh, nay, lass, nay. Some terrible, awful news to tell you. Oh. You better brace yourself, lad. Well, for the line, you mean, I was waiting for it. <laughs> He used to accuse me of forgetting my lines. And while he was saying, you've forgotten your line, and me acting up to it, he'd remember what he'd had to say anyway. I said it's going to be fame, didn't I? I'm fortune. I'm with a bit of luck, Chuck. You'll know your words yes. next time, yes. In that time, his brain would click, 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 and it would all come together. As you go. A lot of his stuff was rehearsed ad libs. Whenever we were in a rehearsal room and I was doing one of my singing numbers or my singing and dancing numbers with the girls and all that, you know, at the end of it, he'd always say, Shock, you wasn't, wasn't that awful? I had no idea at all that you could sing so well. Really, you have a marvellous voice. I mean that very what, what, sincerely. What a, what a lovely thing to say, <laughs> Frank. What a beautiful. Shocking, wasn't it? <laughs> it was rehearsed. I admit to it. Frankie's act reflected a lot about the real Frankie. Well, <laughs> how are you? Are you? Yes, good. Yes. Oh, I'm fine. Yeah, well, you know, you know, I have the aches and pains, but nothing much, because I, it's mostly nerves with me. He was racked with insecurity, uh, racked with nerves. <laughs> Don't laugh, it's wicked to mock the afflicted. Frank was uh, normally in the wings before he went on, uh, 
popping one pill or another. Uh, I, I didn't know what colours were what, but they were, sometimes they were uppers and sometimes they were downers, and he needed those just to get him on. Uh, but once he was on, the only pill he needed was the applause. Look at her, all toffee-nosed. She's sat here, look at her, she's going, so long, no, she's stopping. She's saying, I do hope he's not going to be vulgar. Don't worry, Mrs. I know your type of fur coat and no knickers, so don't sit there stepping at us, mate. The comedian, in my mind, is that uh, somebody who really goes out there and is very funny and kind of is very funny off stage. Frankie is very, was very serious off stage. He fancied himself as an actor and then he drifted into comedy, but he never really enjoyed it. He, he hated what he did. I am Beryl Cattleband. <laughs> There must be something wrong with her. Um, would you permit me to introduce myself? I am Francis A. Howard, Esquire. Oh, don't touch me. I, I can't stand men touching me. Didn't I tell you? No. <laughs> he loved filming and he loved making films. And that was his ambition. Frankie's first film was a starring role, but deprived him of his vital link with live audiences. Frankie was an enormous star. I mean, you know, the idea of making a movie with Frankie was was, was great. It's a bit eerie, isn't it? Don't be frightened, girl. I'm right behind you. He very much wanted this to, to, to turn him into a, a film star. Um, I don't think it worked out that way. How was that? Mm. Isn't it marvellous, eh? I could have walked this way, I could have walked that way, but no, this is me. I think it's very difficult for a comedian who's used to, you know, being a stand-up comedian, working on, in front of, and working off an, uh, an audience, um, uh, to suddenly find him or herself in a in a studio situation, which is notoriously difficult. Aren't I going to see a doctor? All in good time, Mr. Bigger. We must get our clothes off and get into bed first, mustn't we? We. Madam, I have an affliction. I don't think he was ever at home in the cinema as he was when you put him in front of an audience. George! Oh, no. Everyone's seen that gag. Haven't you? Well, I'll carry on, then. He had to be who he was. Because of his acting ability or non-acting ability, he had to retain this uh, um, uh, link with the audience. Oh well, these old gags are the best. Frankie had filled theatres and won vast broadcasting audiences for over ten years. Then it all went wrong. Management wouldn't book me, and agents, they wouldn't book me, you know. Oh no, I mean, I'm, I can re I'm, I remember this very well, but it was between 1958 and 1974. <laughs> Frankie's jokes hit a harrowing truth. At the end of the 1950s, Frankie's comedy career was in crisis. You lose your nerve, and then you don't do so well, and then you're not wanted, so you lose your nerve more. Then you don't do so well, and it goes on and on, and gradually you sort of spiral downwards. He was perceived to be a passe. You know, oh no, he's old, he's, got, he's gone, he's yesterday's man. To use a, an old showbiz uh, expression, he couldn't get arrested, let alone booked or popular or anything. He did tell me uh, about a certain uh, tour that he was on with uh, the great Tommy Steele. Frankie was starring in this show and Tommy was close in the first half and he could not follow Tommy. And within a matter of weeks, the billing was switched. It was awful to witness uh, the bills being taken down and new bills being taken up, you know, Frankie Howard being top of the bill to being put at the bottom of the poster. All of us in the town uh, were unhappy for him. The BBC's head of light entertainment made Frankie's future clear to his writers. We said we would love to write a series of Frankie Howard. He said, no, 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 he's finished. But Frankie's resurrection came from BBC television and the early 60s craze for political satire. Without any regular work, Frankie had tried a new act at Soho's establishment nightclub. About time, I've been waiting a hell of a time here to get on. It's 25 to 12. <laughs> Frankie, of course, did what he always did, which was to ring every scriptwriter in the world and demand uh, jokes. And it was always for nothing. 
You know, it was always an old pals act, you know, and we all did it, and we, we all did it and loved doing it. And to this day, Simpson and Galton moan about the fact they never got paid for it. Well, nobody got paid for it. It was, I think there's so much admiration for Frank and all this great talent being wasted. Everyone may blames Macmillan for second half of the government last year. You see, everyone blames Macmillan for second half of the government, but you see, I don't. No, I'm sorry, I don't. I don't blame him. I blame her. <laughs> from being, you know, virtually finished, I mean, he became the biggest thing in the country again, almost overnight. It was confirmed by doing a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, which gave him enormous reclame in the West End for a, for a whole year. Comedy tomorrow, comedy tonight. With a hit West End show and a new film career, Frankie Howard had gone from has-been to headliner. And over there you see our swimming pool. Uh, oh, yes. It stops a little shot of Wembley, doesn't it? Well, of course, we are trying to get something a little bit more ambitious. Such as a hip bath, perhaps. Sometimes he was troubled. He wanted you to do all the talking. Uh, he was trying to draw things out of you, and not altogether nice things. He used to love asking people very embarrassing questions about their personal life. Whether he was just nosy and trying to get at your sexual uh, uh, life and proclivities, I don't know. But uh, he, he was very interested. He lived a secret life, really. I mean, his, his personal life uh, was well hidden. Uh, and I think he would do anything to deflect attention from himself. Cheeky <laughs> Excuse me, I'm, you're here. I'm, I didn't expect you so soon. When the 1960s began, Frankie Howard was an almost forgotten stand-up comedian. When they ended, he was one of Britain's biggest comedy stars. Oh, what are you doing? Blubbing. Pardon? <laughs> Blubbing. Ah, oh, poor little blub. <laughs> Blubber. He's having a whale of a time. <laughs> Look, if you don't like subtlety, you may as well switch off. Frankie's comic approach could have worrying side effects for his co-stars. He really used to say terrible things. I mean, if you're quite young and you're very conscious of your body and everything, and I was very thin at the time, he used to say something like, do you know, she's the only girl I know with two backs, which is mortifying. I've got to get some it off me chest. <laughs> that won't take long, will it? <laughs> Another one with a small part. <laughs> but then I'd go to my mum and my aunties and say, do you do you mean? Do you know what that Frankie Howard said about me today? And they'd go, oh, he's <laughs> near card. And with nothing else for it, we'll have to do the song and dance. All right, then? One, two, three, four. Come on, come on. Don't you know it? Do I, you, do I look as though I know it? Impossible for him to ever, ever dance. The pines are chipping the stars. A whole lot of water and a whisk. I did watch him playing tennis once, and it was the same thing. I mean, when he ran uh, to, to get a ball, uh, you know, with, with his racket in hand. I mean, it was everything was... Nothing was coordinated at all. Yesterday, all my trouble seems so far away. <laughs> That's yesterday. Well, it sounds more like a fortnight. <laughs> I walked right into that one, didn't I? I must be the most reluctant straight man in the business. Frankie would tell you straight. Um, he worried about other comics and other actors upstaging him. Pardon me, do you know the road to the aisles? Oh, yes. Would you like me to play it? No, take it. <laughs> I had to be subservient in the comedy line with Frank because uh, when I worked with him, uh, I automatically became the straight man. What do you think about the... Um, and you mentioned a, you know, a, a, a star or uh, up-and-coming... Uh, comedian or someone. What do you think about them? I mean, do you think, do you think they're funny? Do you think they're funny? Um, yeah, I think they're funny. Mm, they're, uh, and he lost interest, really, when you said yes. In the 1970s, with his own series of comedies, Frankie finally made it as a film star. Darling, you know what they say. Don't knock it until you've tried it. He had to have a medieval wig over his other wig. And we had a wonderful uh, hairdresser called Ramon Gao, who had, Raymond had been told not in any circumstances to, um, to mention this 
fright wig that Frankie always always wore. And uh, so he waltzed straight into the hairdressing room on the first day, picked it up and said, what's this bit of rubbish? And there was a terrible explosion. And uh, we, had to find, um, we had to find his lady assistant to do Frankie's hair. He would never admit, although Frankie was Frankie, you'd see sometimes when he glued it on, the glue would be all down the sideburns because he was just so... That was Frankie. There were two areas you didn't discuss with Frank. One was his personal life, and one was was his uh, tonsorial arrangements, which, <laughs> which were a well-guarded secret. Frankie's anxieties were often removed by a relaxing evening at the dogs. He'd get his wallet out, and he'd open it up, and there was like a little purse inside the way, and he'd open it up. He said, I'll have half a crown each way on the number three dog or the number four dog and then he'd close it all up and put it back and take the receipt and put it away and he probably did about seven and six on the night in cold blood, <laughs> blood. we've all done about 150 quid you know. but he 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 always paid the bill and and was very very generous host he was really a very good friend he was someone you could go to in trouble and he did a tremendous amount for uh, people for friends who were in hospital or, or something. Frank would always be there. He would have probably liked to have been married and had a family. Dad, did you come in here just to talk money? No, I did not. I came to tell you I'm sending you away to school. School? Yes, yeah, school. What the hell for? To get you away from Dolce Vita here for a start. Just because I'm a trendsetter. You look more like a bleeding Irish setter to me. The, the children just adored him and he was you know, the grandfather, really, that uh, my boys never had. I mean, um, my father died when Robert was just 18 months old. So he would come down to their level. He'd like to know people like me with three children and a house in Brighton and Sunday lunches, as Scylla will tell you, you know. He used to phone me up, nine o'clock. What are you having for Sunday dinner? Uh, the phone would go and he'd say, um, Frank here. What are you doing on Thursday? Save it for me, I'm coming down in the evening. We'll be round for dinner at 8.30. We were having roast lamb, till one day he said, and what are you having this evening? And I said, roast lamb. He said, not bloody roast lamb again. Between the two of us, he probably ate out quite a bit. <laughs> I expect you're wondering what I've come for. Oh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> After all, you're a woman and I'm a man. That is to say, horizontally speaking. <laughs> Actually, it's become a matter of some urgency. Uh, yes, it? <laughs> Don't worry, dear, I shan't keep you long. It must be very difficult for him, really, uh, in an age when being homosexual uh, was not exactly helpful to your career. Um, and all these jokes are about big women. Oh, she had, oh, she had, oh. Well, I must say, I could do with something or other. Yes, well, have the something first. <laughs> We'll talk about the other later. He always used to make a, a pass at any male that came within a mile of him. Uh, and it may have been he just didn't find me attractive, but he ne certainly never made, made a pass at me. He was born at the wrong time. I mean, he, he said on more than one occasion uh, about his homosexuality that if he could take a pill, which I think this is very sad, if he could take a pill to cure the way he was, he would. And I found that very sad. Um, I really did. I, I, you know, it was very upsetting to hear that. Because we loved him the way he was. When you're young, you don't need people so much, do you? But I think when you, you know, sort of come to a... You know, when you sort of approach a more... When you reach a kind of a more... Or when you're getting past you know, it... <laughs> need somebody, don't you? Frank's manager and partner was a tremendous um, help to Frank. He relied on him. He was somebody who was always there. He arrived on the back of uh, Dennis's moped, and that must have been in the uh, late 50s, and they were together for an awfully long time. I don't think uh, Frankie would have uh, found life half as easy without uh, Dennis, who was there, and uh, was also quite good at sort of being uh, sharply critical if he felt uh, the old boy was getting out of, out of line. Frankie was always worried that he would go out of fashion again. But in the mid-80s, he was discovered by a new generation of teenagers and students. I said, where is this one-night stand? He said, it's the Oxford Union. Well, I mean, naturally, I thought that was a pub. 
He was a very funny man, and they hadn't seen him before. He was, in a way, a pioneer of those Billy Connollys and uh, um, Jack Dees who now take a theatre for a season and can, and can fill it. The audiences he never forgot were the British troops he went all over the world to entertain. We flew, uh, I think, to Belfast, and it was all very hush-hush. Frank would uh, go straight to the front line, given half a chance. He thought he might have owed some kind of a debt to the army because that was where he was discovered. Get the things going. This is the play. assistant Führer. He wants me to... <laughs> because of all the entertaining the troops, I think he resented bitterly that he didn't get uh, more than an OBE. He used to say, you know, what so-and-so's got a, a knighthood and what did they ever do for the troops? What bank are you, by the way? Uh, Sub-Lieutenant. Oh, I beg your pardon. Sub uh, you're an officer? Yes. Oh, yep. OK. I'll speak very slowly. <laughs> now. The armed forces were amongst his last audiences. In 1992, halfway through recording a television series, Frankie collapsed with heart disease. It was his third illness that year, but for close friends, he bravely kept up appearances. It was Valentine's weekend, actually, uh, so I thought, well, just for love, I'll, I'll take him some chocolates with hearts on and all, all this sort of business. And I walked in on him, and uh, there he was. Oh, I said, oh, thank goodness, chocolates. Oh, good. He said, I can't look another flower in the face. So I said, why? Why is that? He said, well, he said, well, I was in hospital, he said. I had so many flowers, flowers up the walls, on the ceilings, flowers, everything. And I didn't know where I was. He said, I woke up. I woke up. I thought I was in the funeral parlour already. You see, it just went straight into a joke. The comedian Frankie Howard has died in hospital after collapsing at his London home. He was 70. I thought he was 67, 68 when he died, and it wasn't until that Dennis, his manager partner, told me that he was in his 70s. And I had a giggle about that. <laughs> oh, you fibber, I thought. Down in the meadow, in the little fishy pool, lives three little fishes and a mama fishy too. People can do impressions of Frankie. They'll probably do impressions of Frankie for many, many years, probably for, forever. Uh, but th there'll only be one Frankie Howard. This will get to number one of the charts, you know. Ooh, me and Madonna, no problem. So they swam and they swam right over the dam. 